where Messiah so incredibly fulfills everything about the lamb, and not just the lamb, but the sacrifice. The lamb represents all sacrifices. And we've gotten to the point in the series where Messiah is killed. So now what? He is the sacrifice of all sacrifices. He's taken down from the cross. He's put in a tomb. So what happens once the sacrifice is done in the ancient offerings? What happens after that? If the sacrifice is not to be eaten, it is taken outside the camp and burned. It has to be kept outside. The priests are in charge of making sure that the sacrifice is outside the camp. Isaiah 53 says, He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people who the stroke was due. So Messiah was cut off. He was killed but cut off. He literally went outside the camp. When they killed him, when they crucified him, they took him outside Jerusalem, outside the gates. And now he was cut off from the land of the living. And the priests, who were to make sure that the sacrifice stayed outside the camp, the priests, even though they were in sin and they didn't know what they were doing, in the same way, the priests seek to make sure that he stays outside. He stays in a place of death. They try to make sure that the tomb is, is unbreachable. And so even without them realizing what they're doing, that's what you do with the sacrifice. After Yom Kippur, those handling the sacrifice would wash their hands, wash everything. And it's interesting because after those who were involved with the death of Messiah, what they try to do is they try to wash themselves of it, just like Pilate washed his hands, literally. After the sacrifice, what happens? In the Old Covenant, that was it, pretty much, in one sense. But Messiah came as the final atonement. And so when the old covenant sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice is lifted up, everything is done. And therefore, there's something more to come because the old is finished. There's something more with Messiah. There is the ultimate scripture. Speaking of what happens in Jeremiah 31, 31, it says the time is coming, says the Lord. And I share this with Orthodox Jewish people. The Lord says, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, not like the old one that I made when I took them out of Egypt. So so God is saying right there, I'm going to make a new covenant. It's not going to be like the Torah. It's not going to be like that. I'm going to put my law in their heart. And I'm going to forgive their sin. And each of them are going to know me. The sacrifice is what changes the covenants. And there comes something once the final covenant. You know, Messiah is the final old covenant sacrifice that brings in the new covenant. Something happens now, which we know as the resurrection. The sacrifice in Messiah comes alive again. And even this is foreshadowed in the Old Testament because the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies. He's a sinner. He offers up the sacrifice. And then at the end, if he didn't mess it up, he comes out alive. And that's a symbol. That's a sign to the people that it's all been accepted. Their sins are forgiven. He comes out alive. And so as the high priest comes out alive, it's like a symbol. It's a foreshadow of the resurrection because what it's saying is that Messiah rose. It's saying it's done. He absorbed the full force of the judgment, and he's alive again. If he wasn't alive again, we wouldn't know if he absorbed it all. But he absorbed it all and overcame. The love of God rises. So the resurrection is telling you that the sacrifice for sin is complete. For him to rise, he had to conquer it. He had to absorb it. He had to finish it. Isaiah 53, which is this amazing prophecy in the Hebrew Scriptures, speaks of Messiah dying for our sins. But then the strange thing is, it says clearly he's dying, he's dead in his grave, his death. It talks about it several times. And then at the end of Isaiah 53, strange thing is he's alive again. It says he will divide the spoils with the great. The will of the Lord shall prosper in him. So how could he be dead and alive at the end? Only one way, and that is resurrection. Even Isaiah 53 speaks of the resurrection. You even see that in one of the first sacrifices in the Bible, or shadows, when Abraham takes his son, Isaac, and offers him up. Of course, God never lets him do it, but he shows he's willing. He offers him up, and then it says that he received him back as if from dead, as if from, from alive from the dead. Even Isaac coming back to Abraham, the son coming back to the father, is a symbol, one of the earliest ones, of the resurrection. And there's another foreshadow of the resurrection, And that is the principle of the first fruit. The first fruit of the harvest would always be lifted up to God on a certain day called the day of the first fruit. Well, Messiah, for those who don't know, rose on the very day of the first fruit. 
as the first fruits of new life. We're going to be celebrating that. I, one of the things I didn't mention in the announcements, but all the spring holidays are leading up to that. And the resurrection, what, what the world knows as Easter is not Easter. It is the Hebrew feast of first fruits. It's about new life. And so the sacrifice is also linked to this new life. And another shadow of the resurrection is that the sacrifice is linked to the breaking of barriers because it was the blood of the sacrifice that allowed the high priest to get through the barrier. When he had the blood, he could walk through the veil. He could walk through the veil of the Holy of Holies that nobody could walk through. And so what it's saying is the sacrifice opens up barriers. And really, it opens up the barrier between man and God, the barriers of guilt, the barriers of sin and shame. It opens it up. The very first sacrifice as a nation of Israel, which was Passover. And what does that do? And we'll be celebrating that too. But what does that do? That sacrifice opens up the barrier, literally takes the bondage out of their life, and they walk free out of Egypt. And literally, when you see the Red Sea parting, that's all part of the sacrifice. Without the Lamb, that Red Sea would not part. The power of the Lamb is to open up barriers and to bring breakthrough. So the ultimate sacrifice, which is the Lord, which is Messiah, is going to open up the ultimate barriers. No matter what the barrier is, that's the power of God. The very barrier. The symbol was the veil, that big, gigantic veil in the temple, which was, I mean, just went up stories high and thick. And when he died or when he was on the cross, what happened? The Bible said that it was ripped apart. That is a sign. And what was on that veil? The cherubim were on that veil. And where did the cherubim come from? The cherubim come from Eden, when God set them up to be the barrier between man and eternal life. And so here it's this barrier, and now God puts them on the veil, and then when Messiah dies, God rips apart the veil, but he also rips apart the cherubim, because it's a sign that the way to paradise is open. And then what happens? The stone is rolled away. The way is open. The sacrifice is all about that. And something else happens. What does the sacrifices of the Old Testament, what do they bring? They always bring blessing in some way. One sacrifice, the sin offering, brings the blessing of the forgiveness of sin. From the guilt offering, you have the wiping away of guilt. From the shalom offering, you have shalom. You have peace in your life. You have sacrifices that bring cleansing, that bring reconciliation, that bring healing, that bring fullness, that bring freedom. By bringing the person who's the outcast can come back into fellowship. The sacrifice removes, in a sense, curses, removes separation, and it actually brings people into ministry. Once there was a sacrifice that led Aaron and his sons into ministry. The sacrifice does all these things, and all these sacrifices are just shadows of Messiah. What's it saying? The sacrifice of Messiah brings blessing and blessing and blessing. It's not just theological to say, well, you know, I'm right with God. What it is, is the blessing of peace and shalom and forgiveness and freedom and the calling being fulfilled in your life. That's all brought to you by the blood of Jesus. It says in Isaiah 53, by his stripes, by his being whipped, we are what? Healed. And the punishment that brought us what? Shalom, peace. And that shalom doesn't just mean peace. It means literally wellness, wholeness, healing, prosperity will come through that. In Daniel 9, it says Messiah will come to Jerusalem. And then it says he will be cut off and he will come to finish the transgression, to end sin, to seal up vision and prophecy and usher in everlasting righteousness, he usher in blessing. It's all part of that. After the resurrection, you have these strange statements. He says, do not touch me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now that has a Levitical thing to it. Because you could not just touch the sacrifice. Once the sacrifice is offered, nobody could touch it. The priest even has to be finished with it. The sacrifice brings shalom. And what did Messiah say? When Messiah first saw his disciples, what did he say? In King James, he said, peace be unto thee. Of course, he never spoke King James. <laughs> what he did say was, shalom alechem. That's exactly what he said. Shalom alechem. And what is that? Alechem is upon you, and shalom is all those things, blessing, prosperity, fullness, wellness, all that be upon you, all blessing be upon you. You know, notice something, when the sacrifice was done in the temple, and everything was reconciled, the high priest can come out and he can say the blessing, the blessing that we're going to say at the end of this service. 
the Aaronic blessing. How does the Aaronic blessing end? It ends with one word, shalom. It ends with shalom. V'yasem lecha shalom. And the Lord give you shalom. When everything's finished, shalom can come. The point of getting reconciled is that shalom can come. When Messiah comes on the earth, shalom will come. And so Messiah, he is the ultimate sacrifice. He doesn't end with shalom, he begins with shalom. As soon as he comes, the first thing he says is shalom to his disciples. First thing, the sacrifice is done, and now he begins where the old finished, he begins with shalom. And then he says, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Therefore go, in the sacrifice, now, he didn't say that before, in the sacrifice all authority comes. All authority to forgive any sin, authority over sin, authority over guilt, authority over separation, authority over the curse, blessing, restoration. And what would happen when the sacrifice was offered up on the Day of Atonement? It'd be offered up where? On the altar, on the brazen altar outside. But then what would happen? They would take the blood of that sacrifice, the high priest, and he would enter in through the veil, and then he'd come to the Holy of Holies, he'd come to the ark, and with the cherubim there, and he would sprinkle the blood on the ark. So what is it saying? The sacrifice is offered up in the courtyard, you could see it, but then the high priest goes in where you can't see him anymore. He goes from the realm of the visible to the invisible, nobody could see what's happening. He goes from the outside to the inside. He goes from the place where all the sacrifice is being offered up to a place that is the ultimate, it's a symbol of heaven. It's the Holy of Holies. It has the cherubim, like the beings that are around God in his presence. So what is it telling you? Listen, the mystery as Messiah is offered up on the altar on earth, but then he must go from the altar to the Holy of Holies. He must go and ascend to heaven. He must go from the realm of the visible to the realm of the invisible. He goes to be with God just the same way. So he has to ascend to heaven one way or the other. He has to enter the realm of the Holy of Holies with the blood. Hebrews, he kind of alludes to this. He entered the eternal, the heavenly tabernacle. He enters into God's presence. So that's why he said, I must ascend to my father in heaven. There was a sacrifice that was offered up that is called in Hebrew, Ola. Try it. If you're Spanish, it's high. But if you're Hebrew, it's something else. Ola in Hebrew, means the entire offering. It means the burnt offering. It means the ascending. It literally means to ascend. It's the offering that gets totally consumed and goes up in smoke. The burnt offering. The Hebrew is that, ascend. So after accomplishing salvation, Messiah is the entire offering. He's the epitome of all offerings. What does he do? He ascends where? To the throne of God. He ascends to the center of the universe to present the atonement before God. And interesting, how does he do it? He does it through the Mount of Olives. And that's interesting because you see in Ezekiel, and we were just standing there, we were just standing at the Golden Gate not too long ago, that Eastern Gate that's sealed up, that's not going to be open until Messiah goes through it. And we were there, and you could look and you see the Mount of Olives, and Ezekiel saw a vision, that said, I saw the glory of God leave the temple through the Eastern Gate and go up to the mountain, the Mountain of Olives. And then it says at the end, Ezekiel, as we get to the end part, it says, I saw the glory come again. It came down, went the same way and went into the temple. And that's a sign of Messiah. Messiah went up through the Mount of Olives, will come down through the Mount of Olives. But even that is linked to the sacrifice because on the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, the scapegoat would be led out east of the temple and would go up the Mount of Olives. And the last place you would see the scapegoat, he would disappear. The last place you'd see him was on the Mount of Olives. He disappeared there. So Messiah is the scapegoat. And when he goes up, he goes up the same way that the scapegoat went up. And then he disappears from this world. Disappears as the scapegoat did. In Hebrews, after making atonement, after offering himself up, he presented himself. He entered in the presence of God. In the Yom Kippur Day of Atonement, you had the goat that was offered up and you had the goat that was sent out into the wilderness called Azazel, which we translate as the escaping goat, the scapegoat. And so in many ways, so Messiah is the scapegoat. Israel, in a sense, has sent him away, like the scapegoat. And even, you know, what happened with the scapegoat? They would put the sins of the nation upon that goat. The high priest would confess it and send it away. Well, what happened 2,000 years ago? 
for the most part, although there were many Jewish people who accepted him, but the nation's whole started with the priests, they basically, they put their sins on him. They accused him of sin that he never did. They put their sins upon him, and they still been a scapegoat for 2,000 years. And for 2,000 years, the Jewish people have had no temple. They've had no sacrifice. They have had nothing. They've had no Yom Kippur, nothing. They had no sacrifice on the day of sacrifice. And at the same time, Jesus, Yeshua, has become a scapegoat. And that's kind of God is saying, do you see this here, Israel? He is the one. And he's dwelt outside of the camp of his own people. He's been with the nations and not with his own people. Outside of the camp, that's what happened to the scapegoat. He dwells outside the camp. It says in Hebrews 13, let us go outside the camp where Messiah is. He's always outside the camp. He's outside the camp of culture. He's outside the camp of acceptance. He's outside the camp of Hollywood. He's really always outside the camp. And so we cannot be ashamed to dwell with him, no matter what that brings to us. Because he was not ashamed to dwell with us when it brought him death. Amazing thing, the temple of Jerusalem. You know, Messiah said, this temple's like my body. You destroy it, I'll rise again, he said. But the temple was the place of sacrifices. All the sacrifices went to the temple. And Messiah is saying, my own body, he's leaking it to the temple. And the meaning that all the sacrifices that brought peace are in him. Where you meet God, that's in him. And something happens. Four decades after his death and resurrection, what happens? The temple of Jerusalem is destroyed, raised to the ground, wiped out. And with it, no more priesthood, no more guilt offerings, no more sin offerings, no more Yom Kippur, nothing. Why? Because Messiah is all those things. And Messiah came as the sacrifice of sacrifices. That was in 70 AD, which changed world history as the temple was destroyed, Jerusalem burning in ruins, the destruction of that. And that's all linked to Messiah coming. Daniel said, Messiah will come and then the city will be destroyed. And then the amazing thing, because the New Testament says that when he died, the veil of the temple was torn in two. But the rabbis themselves record that all of a sudden, all these strange things started happening in the temple. And all these strange things happened. The doors would open by themselves, as if anybody could get in. And the scapegoats, some of the weird things that had to do with atonement, something strange, something cosmic happened. And they give the year, they said it happened about 40 years before the temple was destroyed. That comes out to about 30 AD. That just happens to be the time that Messiah died for our sins. Amazing. It's right there. Israel dwelt without a sacrifice for 2,000 years. And yet the Old Testament says you can't get away with that. You can't go without a sacrifice. So what do they do? They had to come up with a new system. The rabbi said, well, we don't need sacrifice anymore. We can do good works. We'll get in that way. Well, the Bible doesn't give you that option. What's the answer? You only, you're only you all in trouble. Either God said you have to be saved by the blood of the sacrifice, but I'm taking that away. So that means we're, we're all in trouble. Or the new covenant has come. If we're under the old covenant, if, if, as the Orthodox believe, then they're in trouble because they're not keeping it. There's no way you can even begin to keep it without a temple or a sacrifice. There's no atonement. So either you're in trouble and there's no hope, or you've got the new covenant that God promised has come through Messiah, the final covenant. You can even see it. Because the point of the sacrifice, one of them, was to remove guilt. So what happens to the Jewish people? They become the most guilt-ridden people in world history without a sacrifice. I mean, with the expression Jewish guilt. But you know, there's actually an offering called the guilt. It was the guilt offering called the guilt, Asham. It's giving you a clue about what something that's going on. Another offering was called the Shilamim, the peace offering. And that was the sacrifice that gave them peace. But they're without a sacrifice. What's happened to the Jewish people? For 2,000 years, they've been the people more than any other whose history is known for having no peace. No matter what they try to do, no peace. Go back to Israel, that's going to be the answer. We get back to Israel, we'll have peace. Yeah. Messiah said, your shalom is hidden from you. There is the hata'ah sacrifice called the sin offering. It takes away sin, but what happens? Without that, the Jewish people become the most weighed down people in dealing with sin. They become the most burdened people. Those who were without a sacrifice were, or, or who were called unclean were dwelling outside the camp back then. The lepers, they had to be outside the camp. They could not be in, and their restoration was linked to the sacrifice. The Jewish people, without the sacrifice, what happened? They were cast out of their own land, outside the camp for 2,000 years. Their own holy land. 
as lepers, in a sense, from the world, wandering the earth without the sacrifice. The sacrifice was crucial to have access, to have fellowship with God. But without that, you don't have that. One of the things that opened me up to God, well, actually, first it closed me to God and then opened me up to God, is that I was in the synagogue. And in the synagogue growing up, one of the things I saw, I saw all the rituals, but I heard about the stories of David and Isaiah and God speaking, and there was a big disconnect because I saw that in the Bible times, God spoke and he moved and he touched people's lives. But in the synagogue, I didn't see any of that. The rabbi never got up and said, hey, God talked to me tonight. He spoke to me. God changed my life. Never. It was all like a memory of something that once was. And so I said, there's no God. I became an atheist until the Lord showed me that atheism doesn't work. I lost faith in atheism. <laughs> it had to be something. But it was that very disconnect without the sacrifice. You don't have that open door. You don't have that flowing whoever you are. And the mystery gets deeper. What is it that the sacrifice bears? The sacrifice, and this is not milk. This is meat here now, so stay focused. The sacrifice doesn't bear its own sins. It bears another sin the sins of the offerer. So Messiah is the sacrifice for all of us. First for Israel, to the Jew first, and also to everybody. But the Jew is a link to this because he came first there. So they are the people. He died first in Jerusalem. His death wasn't, Isaiah said, it wasn't for himself. It was for my people to whom the stroke was due. It's for everybody, but the Jews are the first. They represent everybody. His cross wasn't really his cross. It was our cross. His rejection and suffering, was his passion wasn't his passion, it was our passion. So what happens if you have no sacrifice to bear all this? Or you miss it? What happens? You bear it yourself. If he doesn't bear your judgment, you bear your judgment. God gave the Jewish people to be a sign to all people, of what all people are. It's like everybody else except more so. For 2,000 years, the Jewish people have been bearing their own judgment. If Messiah bore their suffering... And now, and they don't have their Messiah, then they're going to be a sign of those who bear sufferings without having that. They were to be his people first. They were to be, every believer is called to be conformed to the image of Messiah. But so his own people, the Jewish people, were first called to do that. The Jewish people have become, this is a real mystery, they become, even in being separated, those who don't know Messiah, they have become conformed into the image now what do i mean what other nation is described so much as like lambs to the slaughter the jewish people what other nation has been called scapegoats the scapegoat people who are the, the jews scapegoat has to do with the holiest day of judaism it has to do with the holy the scapegoat is holy it has to do with yom kippur it's, is it a coincidence that the same people just happen to be called scapegoats by everybody they're made scapegoats what do people do they cast their sins on the jewish people what is that it's like they're replaying Messiah because Messiah bore their sins and all of our sins. What happened to the sacrifice led to the slaughter. How many times have they been led to the slaughter? The Jewish people. It becomes that way. There's only one true sacrifice. And so what happened is he is the scapegoat. But if you don't have him, if, you're not, if you don't take part of him, you become the scapegoat nation. That's what they became. And then there's the, I told you, there's that word Ola, Ola, which means the whole burnt offering the ascending offering. Messiah became the Ola. But if his people don't receive it, what's happened is their own history bears witness of it. It's the offering that goes up. It was translated into Greek. It's a completely consumed burnt offering. So the word in Greek for burnt is kaustos. And the word for complete is holo. Put it together, it becomes holocaustos, holocaust. What nation has gone through what the world sees, knows that's Holocaust. That's a name of a sacrifice in the Bible, translated into Greek in, a, in the Septuagint as Holocaust. And a lot of people speak of the, even that whole thing as the crucifixion of the Jews. It's almost like without their shepherd, they became vulnerable to the wolf, to the enemy who hates them. Even from the beginning, when Abraham offered up Isaac on the wood, Isaac was then the entire Jewish nation. It was all in this little, this, this boy or this youth. It says he was off to be offered up as what? The Greek Septuagint, the ancient translation in Greek, says he was to be offered up as a holocaust. Even from the very beginning. And that whole thing, of that whole picture of Abraham offering up Isaac is a picture of Messiah being offered up. It's the father, Abraham, means father. 
taking his beloved son, putting him on a donkey, and bringing him on a donkey to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, putting the sacrificial wood on his shoulders and having the son bear the wood up to the place of the sacrifice. And once he gets to the place, he's bound to the wood. And then the knife comes up, but it stops. Abraham. God says, no, Abraham. But because you did this, I will confirm my covenant. And what a covenant is, is when one is willing to do it, the other is willing to do the same thing. So God says, basically, you're willing to offer up your son, I will offer up my son through you and through your son. And so the father takes the son, just as Abraham did, the father God takes his son, puts him on a donkey, leads him to Jerusalem, puts the wood on his shoulder, leads him up the mountain to the place of the sacrifice, binds him to the wood, and then lifts up the knife of judgment but does not hold back. And Messiah dies for our sins. Where? On Mount Moriah. What is Mount Moriah? What's on Mount Moriah? Calvary is on Mount Moriah. The same place where Isaac was lifted up. And so you see all this. Here you have Abraham and Isaac, this foreshadow, speaking of Messiah, and yet you have also the word Holocaust as well. It's a, such a deep thing. It touches everything. It's so deep. God is so deep. See, what is it saying? The Jewish people kind of show this all the time. Even with the holidays, when you don't have him, something's missing. So we celebrate Passover, the Passover without the Passover lamb. It's a Passover with no lamb. Does that make sense? I mean, the word Passover literally means the lamb. It means the Passover lamb. You have a day of atonement without the atonement of the day. For 2,000 years, no atonement. Something's missing. Really everything. You have a jubilee with no jubilee. You have all the, you have a Sabbath without the power of the Sabbath because he is the center of everything. And that's true with every one of our lives. But the Jewish people show it even more so because they're a sign that when you don't have him, it's, everything's missing. Without the sacrifice, there's no real Passover. There's no real atonement. There's no real Sabbath. There's no real peace. And the mystery, the Jewish people, with, while living without the sacrifice, have become conformed to his image. Knowing in the nations, as Messiah was on earth, he was rejected and accused and falsely accused. They've been falsely accused and rejected and sent out just like he was. They've been stripped of their possessions just like he was stripped of his robe. As he was humiliated, so they. As he was dehumanized, so they. As he was crucified in their way, so they. Ultimately, even this. Even with Isaac on the mountain, Abraham God says, no, Abraham, don't do it. I was just, it was a test, but you passed it. As they looked up and they saw a ram caught in the thorn bushes by its head. That's the sign. That's the sign. To be offered up, that ram was lifted up as a sacrifice. Interesting, because in that place, that's where they built the temple. That's where all the sacrifices were, in that place. And the sign that it's fulfilled is when you see the sacrifice also with thorns on his head. The sign of the ram, the sign that it's come. And here it happens, so on Passover, death strikes down the firstborn son or wood. But the Passover lamb dies in place of the son. And so the lamb that will bear the judgment happens to do it all on the Hebrew feast of Passover because Messiah is both the lamb and the firstborn son of God. And the one who dies in the place of the other. It all comes together. I mean, it's an amazing thing. Only Messiah is the sacrifice. He's the only sacrifice. But in type, the people, his nation, followed in the course. Because through his sacrifice came blessings to the world. Through his sufferings came blessing. Well, interesting. Because Paul said, through their rejection, blessing has come to the world. Even through, the, in some strange way, in the Jewish people, as they were cast out, the gospel spread. Through their rejection came blessing to the world. And then he says, how much more will their acceptance be but life from death? They even parallel that. And even that, what happens after Messiah died, three days later, he is resurrected, the king of Israel. What happens to the nation of Israel? The nation of Israel in the 20th century under Hitler is, they even call it the crucifixion of the Jews. They are crucified. And what happens? Three years later, they are resurrected. Israel comes back into the world three years after the Holocaust. Comes back a nation that is resurrected, which makes sense because it happens to have, it's the only nation that has, a, its king was resurrected, and a nation has to follow its king. Even when they don't know him yet. 
Now listen to this rabbinic statement. This is the rabbi's writing. It's amazing. Listen to what they say. They said, as long as Israel dwelt in the Holy Land, the rituals and the sacrifices they performed in the temple removed all these diseases from the world. But they continue. But now it is Messiah who removes them from mankind. What are they saying? This is the rabbi saying that Messiah took over for the temple. There's no temple because there's Messiah. And as the temple removed curses and shame and guilt and disease, so now Messiah is do removing that from people, which means it must be now that Messiah is presence and his work is in the earth, which brings us to the other side of the mystery. And that is 2,000 years ago, it wasn't just the Jewish people who went out from Jerusalem, but the word of the gospel went out at the same time which has changed the history of the world. And what is the message? The message is we're all under judgment. We've all sinned. But God came into the world. He became flesh. God gave his son to the world with a power of life and a life without sin and yet was judged, handed over to the priest to be offered up. And through the Romans, he came down to our life. He walked in our shoes. He died on a cross in our place, bearing judgment upon himself, which was not his but ours that we would be cleansed and forgiven and free. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. That the forgiveness of sins would be preached to all, and whoever would receive him would be set free and born again. What is that message? That is the gospel. But that message is also the message of the sacrifice. It's as Levitical as a message could be. It's mind-boggling. It's so radical because you can't even understand this without Leviticus. It goes against the entire grain of any... Nobody could come up with this. Proclaiming that a man who was executed as a criminal by a Roman execution stake is the redeemer, is the answer. That's totally crazy for man. But the mystery is found in Leviticus, even from the beginning. He came down to earth. Why? Because the sacrifice has to identify with us. He had to become flesh and blood. Why? Because the sacrifice has to offer itself up in bodily form. His whole life had no sin and no spot. Why? Because the sacrifice has to be without sin. And his life was filled with the power of life because the sacrifice brings life. This Messiah, Yeshua, this Jesus of Nazareth is the chata'ah, the sin offering. He's the asham, the guilt offering. He's the olah, the whole offering. He's the shiloim, the peace offering. He's the Pesach, the Passover offering. He's Azazel, the scapegoat. He's the Kippur, the atonement. He's the Rashid, the first fruits. He's everything. He's, the, he's the, every sacrifice rolled into one. Executed on sacrificial wood, just like the blood of the lamb was on the doorway of Passover, on the beams of wood, on the very place where Abraham offered up Isaac. He was wounded for us so we could live. Our sins fell upon him so we could be healed. He was condemned so we could be set free. His eyes closed so our eyes could be opened. His life ended that we could be born again. And in that sacrifice, this transference, this is about the sacrifice, there's always a transference. You put your sins upon the sacrifice, but then the life of the sacrifice, the blessings come upon you. And that is that here we put our sins on him, but he puts his blessing into our life. He puts his life into our life. He puts his nature into our life, if we'll receive it. The power of God, the anointing of the Spirit, to do what? You know, what else goes from Jerusalem? This, this gospel to proclaim good news, the power of redemption. What is all that? That's the power of the sacrifice. It's no accident that everything begins after the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension. Now comes the Holy Spirit, the power of the sacrifice. Comes mercy, forgiveness, freedom for all who will take it. What do we learn? We learn this is big, God is deep. And this is serious and this is for real. Everything hangs or falls on him. For 2,000 years, his people have been without him. They wandered the earth helpless, bearing everything that they didn't have to bear. They've gone through hell on earth because those who are without, you know, if you don't let him do the judgment, there's, you, got, you got your own judgment. They need the lamb. They, they desperately need the lamb. They're literally wandering the earth without the lamb. They need him. And so therefore, first of all, don't hold back from sharing the gospel ever. Because he's the only hope. The greatest sin is to have the answer and not share it with those who are perishing. Give them the lamb. All that they've gone through, and yet the lamb is there. He came for them first. What do we learn? 
His own people could even miss it. That means we, his own people, can also miss it. Who knows how much we've gone through that we don't have to go through? How much trouble, how much lack of peace, how much junk, because we didn't do it with him. Because we haven't given it to him. Because we haven't really trusted him. Because we haven't let him bear it. Because we haven't really sought him with all our heart. Let him take it. Give it to him. And who knows how many blessings and treasures are waiting for us. They're in the Lamb. I mean, God promises joy and life and peace and abundance. He promises that. He doesn't promise no problems. He promises abundant life. He promises blessing. So if we're not having it, we're not really dwelling. We're missing something. Then we're not really dwelling. We're not really seeking Him. Or we're seeking somewhere else. The sacrifice was to take all curses. The sacrifice to give all blessings. Who is Messiah? He is the Lamb. What does that mean? He's come to take off every curse from this world. He's come to take every burden from our lives. Every dark thing, you can be released and you can be free. But the key is you've got to give it to him. You've got to receive from him. You've got to put him first. You know, you've got to let him have it. Your sins are his. They don't even belong to you anymore. Remember that. If he took your sins on the cross and you're still living in that, he took your guilt and you're living in it, then you're a thief because they belong to him. Your fears, give it to him. Your past, give it to him. Your reputation, let it be his, that his can be yours. Your problems, your shame, he doesn't have to be your problems anymore. Let it be his problem. That thing that haunts you, let it be his dealing. See, he already took it, but it doesn't mean anything if you don't do it with him. So that you got the sacrifice, you got Messiah, but the other side is you got to partake of it. Those who are the most blessed in God are those who are most partaking in what he said. And those who don't, those who are not blessed are those who are not. Your sins already belong to him. The lamb has taken it. And from the lamb comes every single blessing, all good things. But we got to receive it. And it's not just a general thing. Yeah, theological, he died. But it's much more than that. He didn't just die generally. He died 